Today we're going to talk about the diffusion through a membrane lab that we completed in class. On your handout that you have in front of you, what I'd like you to do is I would like you to label the before and after situations using the letters G for glucose, I for iodine, W for water, and S for starch. You may want to color code it for yourself to make it a little bit easier to see things. What I'd like you to do is I would like you to label where each of those substances appeared at the beginning of the experiment when you first set it up and then where they appeared after the experiment once it has run. So pause, try to do your labeling, and we'll see how we did. As you can see in my example here, I used red for glucose, orange for iodine, blue for water, and purple for starch. In the situation that we had, there was a greater concentration of water outside than in, so I drew more water molecules outside of the baggie than inside. There was iodine in the solution, which was that amber or rusty colored substance that we added to the water in the solution, but there wasn't any at the start of the experiment. Inside of our simulated cell or plastic baggie, we had starch that we dissolved into a solution of water, as well as glucose that we dissolved into the solution. There wasn't any starch or glucose outside of the bag at the beginning of the experiment. Once the experiment took place, we were looking to see which types of substances or which of the substances actually were able to move by diffusion, if any at all. Remember, diffusion is going to move from an area of greater or high concentration to an area of lower or lesser concentration without the use of energy. And if you remember from the experiment, this wasn't a living cell, so there was no energy available to this particular setup for any sort of other type of movement of the molecules. If they were going to move, they were only simply moving by diffusion. Also remember, if things are moving by diffusion, they're going to want to reach what we called an equilibrium or an equal state so that it's balanced. So if you notice in our after diagram, we can see a couple of things happened some water diffused into the baggie from the solution, iodine diffused into the baggie from the solution, and we recognized that and saw that because when iodine reacts with starch, it's going to turn a bluish black color. And we noticed that at the end of the experiment, the inside of the baggie or cell was a bluish black color. We also noticed that glucose moved out of the baggie into the solution. Now, we weren't actually able to see this. We had to do a test. We had to do a test with our Benedict solution, where we took a sample of the water in the solution in the beaker, and we used our Benedict solution, heated it in a test tube to see if it changed colors. If it changed colors from the bluish color to start with to any other color from blue, Typically in our situation, it usually turned anywhere from an orange to a yellow to a reddish color once heated. That showed that we had glucose in our solution. So in our situation, the glucose moved from inside the bag out to the solution. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause and try and see if you could just remember to label which direction each of these molecules moved based on diffusion. Okay, so let's see how we did. In our situation, the glucose started in the bag, and it actually diffused out. The iodine started out in the solution and went into the bag. So in this situation, it went in. Water, water was a little bit trickier, but there was a greater concentration of water outside of the bag. And that's partially because we had a very diluted solution of iodine. We only added a little bit of iodine to the water solution, whereas inside the bag had a lot of things dissolved. If we were to test this, and many of you saw this in the laboratory experiment, if you leave the setup long enough and you measured the mass of the bag at the be beginning of the experiment, and the mass of the bag at the end of the experiment, it would have increased, showing that something diffused into the bag. And in this case, it would have been water creating that increase in mass. There's one trick here. Starch did not diffuse through the bag. Why didn't starch diffuse through the baggie? Remember, the bag is representing a cell membrane with pores. The pores in the bag are very small just like the pores in the cell membrane. And starch is a very, very large, complicated molecule. 
Sometimes starch can have thousands of glucose molecules strung together, and the molecule is gigantic, and it cannot fit through those small pores of the cell membrane. So starch can't move based on diffusion through a cell. It actually needs to be transported with energy. Let's see how we did with the diffusion in a plant cell. We had our bag simulating a cell, and that was just an artificial scenario just to get us started. Later in the lab, we actually tested diffusion in an actual living cell. We took our onions and we peeled a thin layer of the onion cell and we looked at it under the microscope. And this is what our cell looked like to start. In our situation, we used purple or red onions in order for you to be able to see the pigment so that you could see the cytoplasm as opposed to having to use a stain. In this case, this was our, what we call a normal onion cell under regular situations. Remember that a normal cell has about 99% water inside compared to other cells that maybe have changed. At the end of the lab, we actually added a 10% salt water solution to our onion. And if you remember correctly, it looked a little something like this second picture. Remember, our cell wall is relatively rigid. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause and I'd like you to try to label these cells. Label the cell membrane, the cell wall, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm on both of the diagrams and then we're going to discuss what happened. If you want to remember, salt doesn't diffuse. We're going to keep that in mind as we talk about diffusion. In the case of our plant cell, in the first diagram in our normal cell, our normal cell, the cell wall surrounds the outside of the cell and just inside of the cell wall, you can't really see it, but there sits the cell membrane. The red filling the entire inside of the cell is the cytoplasm. In this case, it was very easy for us because the onion cell has a pigment that fills the cytoplasm and makes it a red color. So we can see where the cytoplasm has filled the entire inside of the cell. Most of you were also able to see the darker nucleus, usually sometimes pushed off to the side. What happened to our cell though when we put it into a 10% salt water solution? If you remember correctly, salt can't diffuse. So what happened? Well, if you notice, our cytoplasm actually became smaller. It takes up a smaller location of the cell and it doesn't fill itself all the way through into the cell wall. Remember, our cell wall barrier doesn't change. So what happened? Water left the cell. There was a greater concentration of water inside the cell at about 99% and we put it into a 10% salt water solution. So that would mean the rest of the solution would be about 90%. So it moved from inside the cell to outside of the cell, dehydrating the cell, removing the water from the cell. Some of you may have also recalled that the inside of that cytoplasm became a darker color, and that's because the pigment was now dissolved in less water than it normally was making it appear to be darker because it was more concentrated. We lost water from the cell. So the water went from inside the cell to outside the cell when we put it into a salt water solution, and that's called plasmolysis. We have said that the cell has plasmalized. Let's talk about some of the applications or diffusion examples that we're in our laboratory setting. Some of the things that we talk about is adding salt in the environment. For us in New York State in the winter time, a lot of us add salt to the roads or salt to our driveways in order to help with the ice buildup in the winter time to melt the ice. Unfortunately, as we learned in this lab, salt can be pretty disastrous for living things. If you think about adding salt to the roads, that salt sometimes can then run off and get into the water supply. That water supply supplies living organisms with their water for growth and daily activities. Take this plant in the diagram for example. If we were to blow up one of the cells in that plant, what do you think would happen to the cells of that plant if we now surrounded it with more salt than it normally would encounter? We learned in the lab what would happen. In real life, what do you think happens when we add a lot of salt to the roads on a regular basis? Another example that we discussed was eating salty foods. Remember going to the movies, eating popcorn, that very, very salty popcorn, 
you eat that popcorn, popcorn goes into your mouth, you swallow it down your throat, and after a little while you notice, wow, I'm thirsty. Why do you get so thirsty? What do you think happens to the cells in your throat? You have now added a lot of salt and a very small amount of water, so it's a very highly concentrated salt solution with the saliva in your mouth. So in some cases, it could be as much as 80% salt and only 20% water. So what then does happen to the cells in your throat? Why is it that you become so thirsty? Why do you think the movie theaters sell a lot of drinks along with their very salty popcorn? The last thing I want to talk about today are two more examples, actually one more example, for diffusion in humans. So we talked about diffusion in plant cells with our example of our onion, but now let's talk about why do we actually digest our foods. If I were to eat a baked potato, what is a baked potato made of? What kind of organic compound makes up a baked potato? Does anybody know? Think about that for a second. I know we talked about it in one of our other units that baked potatoes are actually a storage for plants. They're storing carbohydrates. Do you remember which kind of carbohydrate? It happens to be that they're made up of starch. So these potatoes made up of a lot of starch can that starch diffuse through our cell membranes? Recall back to the lab we just did. In our artificial cell, was the starch able to diffuse through the cell? No. Do you remember why the starch was unable to diffuse through the cell? It's because the starch was such a very large molecule and it couldn't fit through the pores. So in our situation with humans, we use enzymes in order to break down our foods into smaller compounds. Do you remember when we talked about our organic compounds? We talked about the building blocks. Starch was a carbohydrate. The building blocks of carbohydrates are simple sugars. So what our body does is our body breaks down the starch into its building blocks. And in this case, starch's building blocks are glucose molecules. Do you remember back in our lab which one of the molecules was able to diffuse, starch or glucose? It was glucose. Glucose, if you remember correctly, has some special transport channels so that it can diffuse through the cell membrane. So in the example of our digestive system, starch is going to diffuse from our intestines into the bloodstream. There's a greater concentration of glucose in our intestines compared to our bloodstream so it's going to go from our intestines into our blood so that we can then use it for energy in our cells. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to make sure your drawings are complete in your packet and we'll talk a little bit more about the diffusion lab as we get to class.